Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a very special occasion, and we're just delighted that you are here. Um, I'm Angelina Yi uh, with the Leadership and Public, program, uh, public Policy Program at uh, HKUST. Uh, we run a, a joint series with Oxford University um, on issues of public interest, and we have executive programs for policy makers, decision makers, uh, people in both the public and private sectors to come together to discuss issues that are of concern to us um, in Hong Kong. Now, um, Hong Kong, of course, uh, is a very special place, as you know, and uh, you know we have a, a very unique one country, two systems. We have an imminent um, move towards, or let's say transition towards a popularly elected government. Uh, we have many, many um, issues in, in society. Um, we have compressed time and space. And uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, just uh, this yawning gap between the rich and the poor, and so on. And uh, so there are many, many issues for us all uh, as concerned citizens to think about. And uh, LAPP, which is short for Leadership and Public Policy Programs, is a platform for us to come together, to put our minds to ask fundamental questions, and for us to provide some uh, global perspectives and international perspectives, and you know, various different angles of looking at local issues. Um, it is with a special pleasure that I have invited um, Ambassador Sujaya of Indonesia to share with us his views on the rise of China, which is uh, on the tip of tongue of everybody, um, and you know what ASEAN, or the Association of uh, Southeast Asian Nations, uh, think about this new situation that has been created in the region. Um, I have had the great pleasure to meet uh, Ambassador Vijaya when I was in San Francisco a few years ago. And uh, his, pr his uh, introduction of ASEAN's found founding, ASEAN's aspirations, as as ASEAN's plans, was deeply impressive. And I've invited him back. Um, he is now the um, ambassador. Uh, well, let me just uh, backtrack a little bit and, and say that he was, has been posted uh, as a representative of Indonesia to Bonn. Uh, to the United Nations, uh, and he was the ambassador to Cambodia, and he was also the, uh, the first representative of Indonesia to um, ASEAN. Right now, uh, he's the ambassador to the Directorate General of Cooperation at uh, ASEAN, which is uh, short for Association for Southeast Asian Nations, as you all know. So, without further ado, uh, let us welcome uh, uh, Ambassador Swijaya. Thank you, uh, Professor Yi. It's uh, indeed a great pleasure for me to see you again here in, in Hong Kong after our uh, first meeting in San Francisco uh, just a couple of years back. And I remember at that time, you know, the situation was a little bit different as compared to the situation uh, in the region uh, today. This indicates the dynamic of the region. But then uh, I would like also to uh, say good afternoon to all of the participants in this uh, program. It is really uh, very delighted for me to be here. And uh, it is uh, a great honor for me to share some of the thought and views uh, I had in mind on the topic we are going to discuss uh, today. And I would like to thank Professor Yi for bringing me uh, to Hong Kong and, and to have an interaction on this uh, uh, you know, important and, and interesting uh, subject. The uh, views that I'm going to share with you is 
certainly my personal. This is not going to, this is not representing the official position. But then uh, I think you understand what I mean, you know. This is not going to be very far away from the official position as well. <laughs> so as, you know, as we look at the, uh, the, the PowerPoint here, this is really a very interesting time for the region. Uh, people are talking about Asian century. People are talking about, you know, uh, optimism in the region. The region is the home of the second largest and the third largest economy in the world, which is China and Japan. And, also, and this is also the home of the, the largest democracy in the world, which is India. And Indonesia is also very proud to be called as the third largest democracy as well. At the same time, the region is also uh, doing relatively better as compared to the other part of the uh, regions in terms of the economic performances. After the financial crisis back in 2008, I think in the region we have China, India and Indonesia who are still able to maintain a positive growth despite the negative growth in other countries. And the region has also been recovering rel relatively quicker as compared to the other part of the region. And we, 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 we can say that the European Union is still struggling now to, to, you know, to overcome uh, the impact of the crisis that they have before. And Asia is also the host of, I mean, the home of majority of the population in the world. So if we look at the uh, region where ASEAN is also playing a, a, a significant role in the past few decades, I think we are very proud when we say that, you know, uh, while the Chinese economy is growing, we are also uh, very proud to say that ASEAN collectively is also now becoming, if you see from the combined GDP, this, is, this was uh, the data for two, in 2012, ASEAN collectively is the third largest economy in the region. This is after China and, and Japan. And I, I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing the conversation before in Australia, two years ago, some of the people in Australia were saying that 10 years ago, ASEAN economy was still below, I mean, I mean in, in, in terms of the GDP, still smaller than the Australian economy. Now we are very proud to say that ASEAN economy is even bigger than the combined economy of Australia and New Zealand. And this indicates that in the past few decades, we were able to really not only to perform in maintaining peace and stability in the region, but also to promote economic growth and as well as to also improve and promote the prosperity of the people. So despite all of these positive uh, indicators that we are having in the region, of course, we all know that, again, comparing with the other region, we are very much uh, not satisfied, but we are very happy to see that despite all of those problems that we have here in the region, we are still relatively stable. Since the establishment of ASEAN in 67, I think we are very proud to say that there are no, I mean, guns fell silence in the past four decades. There are no open conflict among the countries in the region after what we experienced during the Cold War. I think uh, the region was really very much in the middle of the, uh, that particular conflict back then in 1967. The region also experiencing the proxy wars. They are fighting, but they are not fighting directly to each other. They are fighting in the region. But then now we are after four decades of the establishment of ASEAN, we are uh, better off as compared to four decades ago. But of course, the challenges we are facing in the region is not easy. I mean, it's not a small challenge. It is a complex challenge, 
Uh, it is a complex situation. I think we all know that the region is, I think, one of the most dynamic in terms of the geopolitical as well as geoeconomic uh, situations. So we have heard, based on the topic that we have here, the rise of China and the discussion on how the rise of China is going to impact the countries in the region, how the Chinese is trying to explain that the, the rise of China was a peaceful rise as what they did uh, in 2001, I believe. They issued a document, the peaceful development of China. They are trying to assure the neighboring countries, including also ASEAN, the rise of the Chinese economy, as well as the rise of the, I mean, the improve of the capability in terms of military capability of China is not going to, to be a threat to the region. And that was the reason why back in 2002, we know that we have still uh, territorial disputes. In 2002, we were so encouraged by the agreement between ASEAN and China to sign what we call as the Declaration of the Conduct in the South China Sea. That was meant to build confidence, although we have disputes, although we have you know, uh, differences in how to resolve the issue. But then exactly one year after the issuance of the, the, the document by the Chinese government that their the rise is going to be a peaceful rise, we signed a declaration of the conduct which is aimed at eventually developing also the code of conduct in the South China Sea. And this is one of the most difficult problems that we are facing. And this is also one of the issues that influence the thinking of the countries in the region on whether or not the rise of China is going to be a threat to the neighboring countries, or this is going to be still a peaceful rise as what they already convinced us back in 2001. Looking at you know, the, the, the development uh, in the region, of course, now we see that over the past one decade after the signing of the Declaration of the Conduct, no significant progress achieved in trying to move toward developing a confident building as well as toward developing the code of conduct that we agreed we are going to uh, develop between ASEAN and China in order to create a conducive environment. Of course, the code of conduct is not going to be the means of settling the dispute in the region, the territorial dispute, but at least the code of conduct will be providing the environment that is conducive for the countries who are having the overlapping claims in the region to resort to a peaceful mean of territorial disputes that we have. So this then affected the way of the people thinking about the rise of China. So I think we are in the past few years uh, before what we have now, there was a perception that the way the Chinese government handling the dispute, not only in the South China Sea East, the, the, the region, but also in other parts of the region, we perceive that they are a little bit assertive. And this affecting many countries in the region. And this also created a situation where before we, uh, we agree that this issue will be discussed only between uh, China and, and ASEAN, but then it has already been brought to a, you know, a broader context where because of the lack of the progress in the implementation of the Declaration of the Conduct back in 2010 and also the assertive nature on how the issue was being dealt at that time. Then for the first time in the context of the ASEAN Regional Forum, where ASEAN, this is the only uh, uh, regional mechanism to discuss uh, security issues, the issue of South China Sea dispute was brought into the meeting. And that was really created not a very, you know, it was not really welcome positively by the Chinese uh, government at that time because 
then you know in despite that we are agreed to discuss this particular issue within the context of the DOC declaration of the conduct then it was brought to the ASEAN regional forum and then later in 2011 it was also becoming the topic of discussion now every year in the context of the East Asia Summit, where ASEAN Regional Forum as well as the East Asia Summit, we have all of the major powers in the region participating. But then after all of those uh, not really positive development happening in the past years, it was mainly due to a very simple reason. The reason why we did not able to implement or undertake some confident building projects under the context within the context of the declaration of the conduct was simply because we could not agree on the guidelines on the development of the projects between ASEAN and China. At that time, it was affected by a perception perhaps from the Chinese side that the dispute is not between ASEAN and China but the dispute is between China and each of the ASEAN member state that has a claim in that particular area. So then the delay in adopting a very simple guidelines, which is saying that in, in one of the paragraph, it was saying that before meeting, ASEAN, uh, before meeting Chinese delegation, ASEAN is going to conduct their own coordination meeting. That simple language. It was interpreted by the Chinese as if that ASEAN is going to confront China collectively in this particular issue. And then uh, back in 2011, when, we, uh, when Indonesia was the chair of ASEAN at that time, that uh, deadlock was overcome. And then since then, I think uh, meetings as well as uh, a consultation has already been conducted at the senior official level between ASEAN and China and uh, the issue is now the development is becoming a little bit positive but not really I mean we have to restrain ourselves to be too optimistic here because there was no yet an agreement as to when we start the drafting of the code of conduct so this is one side the other side of the uh, situation in, in the region at that time that is affecting also how we see the rise of China and how ASEAN is going to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, confront the issue. You know that in the past years, when Obama was becoming a president, they introduced what they call as the pivot or rebalancing to Asia. At that time, I remember Secretary Clinton was announcing that the U.S. is not a visiting power in the region, but the resident power in the region. So everything is happening in the region will affect the U.S. And of course, the U.S. is not going to stay idle because this is going to affect uh, you know, uh, uh, their interests in the region. So then this was also, again, perceived by many people as a U.S. attempt to contain the rise of China, although it was already been repeatedly mentioned by many officials from the US, this is not a containment of China, but this is really re-engagement again of the US in the region after they are vacuum for a while when they closed the military bases in the Philippines back uh, you know, uh, many years ago. The new development as well in the region is how India is also trying to posture themselves in the region. They adopted what they call as the Look East policy. The Look East policy of India is a new policy toward engaging more to the countries in the region, especially in the, South China, uh, in the Southeast Asia. But at the same time, this was also a message that India is also have a significant interest to the navigation, freedom navigation in the South China Sea because this is one of the main uh, uh, artery of uh, trade and economy for India. And they have 
really uh, you know uh, significant interest and in many occasions whenever ASEAN leaders is meeting all of those what we call as a dialogue partners of ASEAN they are trying to touch upon the issue of South China Sea in, in, in the joint statement by saying that they are welcoming the progress of course a little bit pressuring that the development of the code of conduct should be uh, you know faster rather than what the phase that we have now so then this has then created distrust and lack on, on lack on lack of confidence in the region so we experiencing a deficit of trust because of you know uh, not mainly because of the rise of china but because of the rise of china as well as you know the the new policy uh, as well as how countries in the region is uh, trying to handle the situations so this is a very you know complex uh, factors that have then contributed uh, to the uh, you know, to, to the growing distrust and confidence uh, lack of confidence at the same time we are also seeing the nationalistic rhetoric which is also very dangerous and action and reactions be it in the south china sea in the east china sea as well as what people are oftenly say that miscalculation both by the, perhaps the, you know, the, the, the commander of a particular uh, Navy ship in, in, in that particular region or the politician will potentially could lead to tension and also conflict. So that was what we had in the past years. But then now, since the uh, new development is happening, in the context of uh, implementing the the, uh, the the code of conduct, I think the, sit the situation is a little bit uh, uh, positive. So that is what we have in the region. And if we look at how ASEAN and China is cooperating between each other, I think despite the fact that we have problems, this has already been acknowledged in many of the ASEAN China summit, we have a problem. We have issue of the South China Sea, but we are committed to resolve the issue in a peaceful manner. But contrary to that, if we look at cooperation between ASEAN and China for the past few years, you look at this uh, slide, the trade between ASEAN and China is growing every year. The trade volume, the trade value we have 2002 was only 54 billion US dollars. 2013, it has already reached almost tenfold. And we are, we are targeting by 2015, it will reach 500, 500 billion US dollars. And I think this is attainable if we look at the trend. And the ASEAN and Chinese leader back in 2013 agreed also to aim at more ambitious target. By 2020, we will have bilateral trade between ASEAN and China uh, uh, reaching the amount of one trillion US dollars. Now, China is the largest trading partner of ASEAN, while ASEAN is the third largest trading partner of, ASEAN, of China. I think in the future, ASEAN will also be the largest trading partner of, 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 of China. So despite the problem that we have, cooperation on other sectors is improving significantly. And I think this is also a very good indication on how ASEAN look at the rise of China, on how ASEAN is engaging uh, China in the context of trying to work together in maintaining peace and stability here in the region. The other big project that we are going to do between ASEAN and China, in addition to setting the target of one trillion US dollars by 2020, 
we are now in the process of negotiation of upgrading the ASEAN-China Free Trade Agreement. Upgrading meaning that perhaps you are not only aiming at having the trade value up to one trillion US dollar by 2020, but also doubling the foreign direct investment of China to ASEAN. In the past few years, FDI from ASEAN to China is still bigger than Chinese FDI to, to, uh, to ASEAN. And I think we agreed that this is going to be a double, but at the same time also, we are now in the process of the negotiation of one of the largest uh, comprehensive partnership in, in, in economic partnership, which is we call as the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Here, the comparison between RCEP and the TPP, comparison between RCEP and NAFTA, comp comparison between RCEP and EU. If we are able to conclude this by the end of 2015, I think we will have a better future in terms of the economic cooperation in the region. And hopefully, this will also contribute to the better future in terms of our collective effort to maintain peace and stability here in the region. And I'm also very happy to share with uh, participants here, we are also starting the negotiation of ASEAN China, F uh, ASEAN Hong Kong FTA. Hopefully, this can be also concluded uh, sooner rather than later. Professor Yi mentioned earlier that this, you know, Hong Kong is very unique, you know, with, with two systems we have, but ASEAN is even more unique. Multiple system we have. I mean, you look at the political system in ASEAN, starting from, you know, uh, uh, monarchy, constitutional monarchy, socialist, communist, and democratic countries. The legal system is also different. So that was the reason why this is not an easy job for all of us in ASEAN, not only in bringing ASEAN unity and cohesion, but also how ASEAN continue to play its role in the region to maintain peace and stability. When we compare the region, Asia, Asia and other, other regions like Africa, Africa, they have African Union, which is membership is mostly all of the African countries. Here in Asia, we don't have similar mechanism except ASEAN, where in ASEAN, we establish mechanism that allow us, the 10 countries, to engage with all major stakeholders here in the region. So here I'm, I'm talking about uh, the mechanism that ASEAN created, be it the ASEAN Regional Forum, where this is the only forum to discuss uh, security issues in the region. The membership of the ASEAN Regional Forum is already more than 20 countries, including ASEAN. And also, we establish what we call as the ASEAN Plus Three, ASEAN dialogue with China, Japan, and Korea, the Republic of Korea. And I think we never imagined before, before the ASEAN Plus Three was established, that we will see an opportunity where the leaders of China, Japan, and Korea are sitting together in the same table, together with ASEAN. In the past, they were managed to develop what they call as a trilateral summit, but then you don't see the summit taking place anymore for the past two years because of the you know, uh, recent development. But in ASEAN, we are trying to bring all of them together. In the last ASEAN Plus Three Summit in Nipido, only last month, I think all of the leaders of ASEAN as well as the Plus Three were there, and they are, again, making their commitment in order to work very closely together. The other mechanism that is also very significant here is the, what we call as the leaders-led East Asia Summit. It was in 2011, the membership of the East Asia Summit was expanded to include Russia and the US. So here, we are engaging not only six of ASEAN dialogue partners here in the region, but also Russia and the US. 
the new mechanism that we established is also a dialogue between the ministers of defense of ASEAN and eight dialogue partners of ASEAN, including China, Russia, US, Korea, Japan, India, and New Zealand. So this is, this is the, the, the platform or forum where we are trying to develop trust and confidence that has already been perhaps in the past years, uh, you know, deteriorating. We are not yet there, but at least what was happening now is perhaps it's enough to say that we are cautiously optimistic on the, on the development in the region. And hopefully this will also contribute to how we are going to manage to, uh, you know, uh, overcome differences as well as dispute in a peaceful manner. So this is the, I have already talked about this before. This is the geopolitical dynamic here. You know, this, the rise of China, the pivot to Asia was perceived by some as, you know, uh, containing uh, China. At the same time, you know, this is the action and reaction miscalculations. You see pictures of ship ramming other, ramming other ship, and that is really very, very critical that will also uh, potentially lead the region into an open conflict. But so far, we were able to bring all of the uh, stakeholders to continue having dialogue and consultations, to continue promoting you know, a peaceful settlement of every dispute that we have. And I think in the past, we also heard that what ASEAN was trying to do is not really doing a balance of power, but what our former foreign minister was saying as creating a dynamic equilibrium, meaning that ASEAN is going to engage all of the parties in trying to channel communications, dialogues between all stakeholders here in the region. Last year, there was also an idea uh, introduced by our foreign minister, the former foreign minister, what he called as the Indo-Pacific Treaty. This is a treaty encompassing countries in the Indo-Pacific region in order to how we will be able to bind ourselves, the countries in the region, into a code of conduct in engaging between each other and this, is, this idea was basically developed from the Treaty of Amity of, and Cooperation we have here in ASEAN. The TAC, we adopted the TAC back in 1976. This is the Code of Conduct on Interstate Relations here in the region, which mainly emphasizing also that every dispute that we have here in the region should be resorted to a peaceful settlement. And the TAC has now been acceded by more than 30 countries, including also all of the permanent members of the Security Council. So, learning from the success story of the TAC, I think this is what our former Minister for Foreign Affairs was aiming. And I think uh, in the last East Asia Summit in Naypyidaw, they uh, took note of the exercise toward developing this treaty. You know, in, in, in this, you know, discussion that we have, in addition to the pivot to Asia, the rise of China, the look is policy. The Russian is also introducing a new concept, what they call as the uh, 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 indefeasible security concept here in the region. So meaning Russia is also would like to very much engage. In addition to that, the EU is also would like to be very much included in the East Asia Summit, which is Unfortunately up, uh, unfortunately, up until now, this is not yet the case. So just very quickly on, on the transformation of ASEAN. This is really how ASEAN is trying to transform themselves in order not only to address or to confront the challenges from within, but also the external challenges that we have. So from this uh, PowerPoint, I would like to very briefly introduce to you the 
evolving nature of the transformation of ASEAN. And in the last uh, summit in, 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 in Bali, when Indonesia was the chair, ASEAN was very confident, not only trying to play its role here in the region, but also in the global community of nations. So that was the reason why we have adopted what we call as a Bali Concord uh, 3, ASEAN community in the global community of nations. So this is not only an imagination. This has already been something that ASEAN has already been doing. Collectively, I think ASEAN member state contributed around more than 5,000, not only military personnel, but also police force as, as well as civilian in many UN peacekeeping operations all over the world. And ASEAN is also trying to engage with all of the partners in, in, in the world in trying to address common issues of you know, common concern. So this is the mechanism that I have that I'm already elaborating before. You see the typical picture of ASEAN leaders where they are trying to you know, link their hand together. This is uh, the spirit of bringing all of the parties to, uh, to uh, discuss issues of be it sensitive or, you know, uh, uh, any issues. In the context of the ECS summit, this is very unique because this is a leaders-led summit. There's no preparation done by the lower official. It is up to the leaders whatever they would like to, to discuss in that particular meeting. And then, of course, whatever decision they adopt, then it will be implemented by by, uh, by the officials. So here we have a picture of the, the nine ECC summit took place in, in, in Nipido, attended by all the leaders, including also President Obama, as well as, well as Premier Li Keqiang. We have the ASEAN plus three, attended by Premier Li Keqiang, as well as the Korean, South Korean president and Prime Minister of Japan. We also have the uh, ASEAN defense ministerial meeting. It was biennial, but it, it now going to uh, become annual. So then more and more engagement between the Minister of Defense will hopefully bridge the gap as well as promote better understanding among the countries here in the region. So to conclude, I think we agreed that united and cohesive ASEAN as well as ASEAN playing its centrality role in the region is very critical. It is not to the interest of many major stakeholders in the, here in the region to see ASEAN disunited. Because ASEAN is the only channel for them whenever the dialogue is not happening between countries here in the region. I'm talking about the East Asia region. Whenever the dialogue at the leaders level, level is not taking place, but they are still taking place in the context of the ASEAN plus three. So meaning that we, will, we are providing an avenue for all of those leaders to meet and to have a discussion in trying to uh, find a peaceful solution of differences as well as disputes. So united and cohesive ASEAN and ASEAN centrality is critical in the region. Effective dialogue Partnership cooperation and effective function of the ASEAN Initiated Forum and Mechanism is also very important here in the region. ASEAN has 10 dialogue partners, and this includes Japan, Korea, China, Australia, New Zealand, uh, here in the region, India, Russia, European Union, Canada, as well as the United States. And now, all of those countries have already been designated the ambassadors to ASEAN in Jakarta, meaning that they will be meeting in a daily basis whenever they, they need to have a meeting. So, as, you know, uh, dedicated uh, ambassadors to ASEAN in Jakarta. As a natural uh, partner, I think there's no other, other alternative for ASEAN, for both ASEAN and China, but to continue working very closely together. As I said before, despite differences that we have, Cooperation on other sectors are growing and improving. And I'm also very happy that this is no longer a taboo 
whenever in all of those mechanism said ASEAN Regional Forum is a summit in what in one of the paragraph in the joint statement or the chairman statement or whatever we call it there is always a mention on the need to implement the DOC declaration of the conduct as well as on the need to expedite the development of the COC which I believe that Chinese government was not very happy back three years ago whenever this mentioned and at the same time I'm also participating in this is also very uh, interesting for me personally participating in the people to people context people to people context is also very critical in trying to promote better understanding among the people of ASEAN as well as the people of China and in that particular meeting although we are emphasizing the discussion on mainly how to promote tourism on mainly how to promote exchange of culture but very encouraging to note for me at that time it was only a few months ago one of the uh, I mean the chairmanship of the friendship association of China and ASEAN which is also high-ranking officials uh, in term of uh, in, in the Communist Party in Beijing is also mentioning that acknowledging that the fact we are growing in our cooperation but we still have a problem in the context of South China Sea and in that particular forum she mentioned that there's no other alternative but a peaceful resolution to that particular disputes so meaning that perhaps confidence is there you know I, I remember in one of the discussion that we have we are trying to promote ASEAN confidence on coming up with the agreement on how to speed up the development of the COC but at the same time we were also asked by the Chinese to promote a confidence within Chinese you know uh, government as well because this is not easy but you know looking at this situation I think uh, we are again optimistic and we are we believe that the rise of China is not really a threat to the region but it's a potential that we will be able to promote a mutually beneficial cooperation between ASEAN and China as well as to maintain peace and stability here in the region and hopefully also the uh, peaceful resolution of any differences and conflicts and disputes here in the region expanding economic cooperation beyond achieving tra uh, trade target I mentioned earlier that uh, we are trying to double the uh, FDI but at the same time we are also now in the process of uh, 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 developing an air transport agreement because tr air transportation is also very significant in ASEAN as well as in China you have heard about the maritime uh, Silk Road which is announced by the Chinese president but at the same time our president Indonesian new president is also introducing what they call what he call as the maritime axis and how this will interact you know in trying to again bridge not only Indonesia and China but also ASEAN and China here we are talking about basically we are talking about infrastructure development and how to make ASEAN becoming a very competitive production base in term of production network supply chains and, and and so on and so forth and this is not new thing for ASEAN and, and, and I mean the countries in the Southeast Asia with China because we have you know the historic historical past which is you know we are very closely linked together with the uh, with the visit of uh, Chenghe at that time to visit all of ASEAN member states particularly Indonesia we still have the the place where he visited in, in, in Indonesia I think we are going to build based on this in the future in trying to bring closer again uh, ASEAN and, 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 and China so uh, enhancing the high-level visit this is now happening I think we have many meetings at the ministerial level between ASEAN and China and I think this is continue to grow the bilateral visit is also uh, increasing now and this is really bringing us closer and improve a better understanding between 
ASEAN and China. So this is how we see the rise of China. And we believe that by working very closely together in a mutually beneficial partnership between ASEAN and China, I think ASEAN will be able to also continue its role that has already been happening in the past four decades here in the region that we were able to bridge discussion, dialogues, and finding a peaceful resolution to any dispute and conflict. And this hopefully will make us uh, a little bit optimistic also to welcome the Asian century here in the region. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Why not? Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Um, Stephen Chung from um, University of London. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know how to word this question, but I, I find it, uh, I find ASEAN has came a very, very long way but I would say it has a lack of vision because ASEAN could become the Asia Union, but it has not choose the real, you know, choose to go down that road. So for example, uh, well, two, two questions. Do you ever see a free trade agreement within ASEAN and between ASEAN and China, for example, like a open sky agreement uh, 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 and some uh, cooperation between where free movement of people, goods and services like the European Union? And the second question is um, ASEAN leaving the individual state to sort out the dispute. Was it a miscalculation because we will have less bargaining power and negotiating power with China, for example, in the South China Sea? I, I don't see the South China Sea problem be solved in the next 10, 20 or 50 years because we're talking about money here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so uh, and the final part is there's a lot of talk about ASEAN on trades and economic partnership, where, where, where it should be. But how about environmental, social, economic development? And, 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 and you talked about on the last part, you talk about people to people. I think that's very important because when government relationship break down, the people to people relationship is more sure. important than anything else. Yeah. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, I think one, the, of course, uh, ASEAN is not yet aiming into creation of the union. There was a discussion before when we drafted the ASEAN Charter. ASEAN remains an intergovernmental mechanism. So ASEAN adopting what we call as an ASEAN way, which there's no definition on ASEAN way. But this is how we are able to conduct among ourselves in trying to achieve what we are, you know, uh, collectively trying to achieve together. South China Sea is not going to be resolved in the next 20 years or 30 years, or even there will be no, I mean, I don't know who will dare to say that, uh, to set up a timetable in order to solve that problem. Just to give you an illustration, Border delimitation between Indonesia and the Philippines, it took us 40 years to negotiate. And some of them are not yet completed. I mean, Indonesia and Malaysia, we did not complete it yet. The boundary, uh, I mean, the border uh, negotiations. We completed with Vietnam, we completed with the Philippines, and it took us 40 years. What is happening in the region is really giving us a confidence to sit down and trying to resolve all of the differences through negotiation and consultations. You mentioned that, you know, whether uh, economic cooperation between ASEAN and China include also other sectors. I mentioned earlier that many sectors, you name it, environmental cooperation is also there. Uh, cultural exchanges, cultural visits, we are aiming at trying to get only 10% the Chinese tourists visiting uh, outside China, which is 
100 million in a year. We are now aiming at 10 percent. It's very difficult. But of course, we are committed to do that. We are working toward that. And for that particular reason, we established back in 2011 what we call as the ASEAN China Center in Beijing. And this center is really playing a very critical role in trying to not only promoting cooperation, economic cooperation, trade, investment, and tourism, but also education, cultural. So bringing together you know, uh, people from uh, ASEAN and, 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 and China. I, I participated in two of those events. They are having uh, many events in a year on how we are bringing the culture, which then finally we made a conclusion that there are a lot of similarities. You know, so when we are similar, I mean, there are a lot of uh, factors that can bring us together. I think this is really uh, potential. So, of course, uh, again, coming back, ASEAN is not yet thinking about developing an ASEAN Union. There was a discussion before. And when we drafted also the ASEAN Charter, we were advised by the European Union not to follow their path. <laughs> and, uh, you know, discussion on, 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 on monetary union was also there before, but then after what is happening in the Eurozone, the discussion died down. I mean, no, more, no, no other, I mean, people do not interest it anymore to discuss about that. This is, this is, this is very unique, you know. It's very difficult to explain what ASEAN way is all about. Sometimes, you know, in the ASEAN meeting, pictures is more important rather than <laughs> subject of the meetings. So you see this, uh, the, the, the picture of the leaders, you know, you know uh, linking their hands together. This is, I mean, this really sends a very positive signal to, uh, to the people. But of course, I'm not saying that we are very happy with what is happening. The challenges are still huge. Not only traditional security issues, but also non-traditional security issues. ASEAN is now moving toward free drug ASEAN by 2015. How this can be done without cooperating with the Chinese government, cooperating with the Korean government, the Japanese government, with, even with Hong Kong. I just read in the news today that you know, a big quantity of, of uh, amphetamine is you know, uh, attempted to be smuggled to Malaysia. And I believe that that is going to also end up in Indonesia. So this is the problem that we are facing. Uh, trafficking, in, trafficking in person is also the other, the other problem that we are facing. In addition to, of course, environment, you say that the uh, sustainable management of the Mekong River is also one of the focus of cooperation between ASEAN and China, ASEAN and the US, ASEAN and Japan. They are all trying to uh, support us in, in, in addressing this, this particular issue. Yes. Uh, I'm just, uh, thank you for your insightful speech. Uh, actually, I want you to hear some voice uh, from Chinese people instead of only the Chinese government. Okay. And uh, uh, first, I want to say is that in 1955, the Vietnam Premier Van Nguyen Thuong they claimed that in the official documents that Xisha Islands and Nansha Islands all belong to China. However, in the late 1970, they send troops and steal these islands from China. And another issue is that we all know that these islands belong to China for more than 1,000 years. And 1,000 years ago, Vietnam still is a part of China. We call it Annan province. Yeah. However, we do not know how it could be these islands belong to Vietnam. Even they claim it belong to China 40 years ago, and then they stole this island 30 years ago. Hmm. 
Yeah, if they see the code so called disappeared, and uh, maybe I can say uh, one day in the future I said, oh, Vietnam is also very near to China, so we can also claim Vietnam belongs to China, and this is also another disappeared reissue. So sometimes it seems like a little ridiculous. And another issue is that we know that in Asia there are 10 countries. And we Chinese people, we think most of the countries, including Indonesia, we are very good friends. We do not have any disputed issue. However, I don't think this also is the same in situation between uh, Vietnam and the Philippines with China. Yeah. And I want to clarify is that we Chinese people usually think our government is notorious for its weakness to the foreigner invaders. Even, mm. even some small countries like Vietnam and the Philippines, how could they invade our lands and steal our oil for so many years? And we, our government do, the, do not do, don't do anything. Yeah. Do okay. not, they do not yeah. take I any get, actions. I get, I get the point. OK, thank you very much. Well, you know, during the, the Majapahit era in Indonesia, the kingdom of Majapahit, which is based in Indonesia, is also covering Indochina, uh, Thailand, and, and Cambodia, and, and Laos. Uh, during Srivijaya also, the same. So I remember when I was, I have to see the parliament, the, the foreign relations committee, because the system we have in Indonesia, the same like in the US. Before you know, we are appointed as an ambassador, we have to see the member of parliaments. And one of the member of parliament asked me a question. Do you believe, you know, there was a prediction before that the glorious kingdom of Majapahit <laughs> will return again? <laughs> you know, uh, this, is, this is the, I mean, I'm, this is the question that they gave it to me. And I'm confronting the member of parliaments in trying to explain, you know, of course, this is, you know, part of the nationalistic sentiment that they have in mind. So my response at that time, that makes him also very happy. I said that I believe that is going to happen again. <laughs> but not in the context of what we had during Majapahit or Srivijaya Kingdom, but in the context of ASEAN community. We are going to have a community where we are respecting each other, where we are trying to cooperate together, where we are having a good, I mean, uh, you know, uh, a community of political security, community of economy, as well as a uh, community of social culture. So, again, I think this is, this is what we need, the people-to-people -people interactions, as I said earlier. Of course, we need to have the people to understand as well. What is the situation? I don't think there is no any intention of any countries in the region to invade China. <laughs> so I don't, think, I don't think that is the case. But what we need to uh, understand is that we are going to work closely together. That was, I said, that was the reason why I said that I don't believe that you know, anybody will dare to set a timetable that the issue in the South China Sea will be resolved in the next 20 years or 30 years. What we are trying to do is to, to try to create a conducive environment. I remember when the, when the DOC was signed back in 2002, there was a saying at that time that uh, we were able to transform the area of a potential conflict into a potential cooperation. And in the last summit in Nipido, I think your leader, Premier Ch Li Keqiang, was saying that ASEAN China has been gone through in the past decade of a golden decade. Now we are moving to what he said as a diamond decade. So a better future by cooperating together between ASEAN and China and also how we will be able to contribute to maintaining peace and stability. I don't, I don't think it is the interest to any countries in the region to see conflict happening here in the region. Um, thank you, Ambassador. I'm Janelino. I'm from the Australian Consulate. Um, <clears throat> I'm very encouraged to hear what you say about ASEAN unity. As you know, Australia has always been a very strong supporter of that. Um, in, as part of the um, 
increased assertiveness in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea. China has shown signs of seeking to reinterpret certain parts of international law with respect to freedom of navigation and so on. I'm wondering in the context of ASEAN unity whether we are likely to see more um, ASEAN cooperation in, I guess, um, standing up for current interpretations of international law. Um, thank you. I don't know where the, that current interpretation of the international law you are referring to, but at least in, in the statement, in the joint statement between ASEAN and China in the context of the DOC, we agree that everything has to be settled through consultation and negotiation based on international law, including also United Nations uh, law of the sea. So we, we stick to that. I don't think we stick to any other interpretation. And uh, of course, just recently, uh, in response to the tribunal proceeding, I think the Chinese government issued a document which is not directly responding to the proceeding, but at least explaining their position on that particular issue. Uh, so what we are going to stick on is on the existing international law, the declaration of the conduct, various documents, including also the TAC that has already been acceded by uh, China and ASEAN, and as well as the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So no, I mean, we are not interpreting any, any, any international law here. And uh, I wish to congratulate you as well. You know, Australia has just concluded a strategic partnership between ASEAN. Uh, and, and I think ASEAN agreed to have a regular summit with the leaders of Australia. Although it's a bit late, but I think in Indonesia, we have a saying, better late than ever. <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, as a very, you know, it's very, it's very interesting, you know, in, 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 in the context of Australia, ASEAN. Australia is the first one to recognize the potential of ASEAN. But you are lagging behind as compared to the other countries. But it's, again, as I said, better late than ever. So we are very, very optimistic to see how ASEAN is going to be also constructively engaged with, uh, with Australia in the future. Thank you very much.